An Account of the Greatest English Poets by Joseph Addison. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia. Since, dearest Harry, you will need to request a short account of all the muse possessed, that, down from Chaucer's day to Dryden's times, have spent their noble rage in British rhymes. Without more preface, wrote in formal length, to speak the undertaker's want of strength, I'll try to make their several beauties known, and show their verses worth, though not my own. Long had our dull forefathers slept supine, nor felt the raptures of the tuneful nine, till Chaucer first the merry bard arose, and many a story told in rhyme and prose. But age has rusted what the poet writ, worn out his language, and obscured his wit. In vain he jests in his unpolished strain, and tries to make his readers laugh in vain. Old Spencer next, warmed with poetic rage, in antic tales amused a barbarous age, an age that yet uncultivate and rude, where'er the poet's fancy led, pursued through pathless fields and unfrequented floods, to dens of dragons and enchanted woods. But now the mystic tale, the pleased of yore, can charm an understanding age no more. The long-spun allegories fulsome grow, while the dull moral lies too plain below. We view, well pleased, at distance all the sights of arms and palfreys, battles, fields and fights, and damsels in distress, and courteous knights. But when we look too near, the shades decay, and all the pleasing landscape fades away. Great Cowley, then a mighty genius, wrote, or run with wit and lavish of his thought, his turns too closely on the reader press he more had pleased us had he pleased us less one glittering thought no sooner strikes our eyes with silent wonder but new wonders rise as in the milky way a shining white or flows the heavens with one continued light that not a single star can show his rays whilst jointly all promote the common blaze pardon great poet that I dare to name the unnumbered beauties of thy verse with blame. Thy fault is only wit in its excess, but wit like thine in any shape will please. What muse but thine could equal hints inspire, and fit the deep-mouthed Pindar to thy lyre? Pindar, whom others in a laboured strain and forced expression imitate in vain. Well pleased in thee he soars with new delight, and plays in more unbounded verse, and takes a nobler flight. Blessed man, whose spotless life and charming lays employ the tuneful prelate in thy praise, blessed man, who now shall be for ever known in sprat successful labours and thy own. But Milton next, with high and mighty stalks, unfettered in majestic numbers walks, no vulgar hero can his muse engage, nor earth's wide scene confine his hallowed rage. See, see, he upward springs, and towering high, spurns the dull province of mortality, shakes heaven's eternal throne with dire alarms, and sets the almighty thunderer in arms. Whate'er his pen describes, I more than see, whilst every verse, arrayed in majesty, bold and sublime, my whole attention draws, and seems above the critic's nicer laws. How are you struck with terror and delight, when angel with archangel copes in fight? When great Messiah's outspread banner shines, how does the chariot rattle in his lines? What sounds of brazen wheels, what thunder, scare, and stun the reader with the din of war? With fear my spirits and my blood retire To see the seraph sunk in clouds of fire. But when, with eager steps, from hence I rise And view the first gay scenes of paradise, What tongue, what words of rapture can express A vision so profuse of pleasantness? O oh, had the poet ne'er profaned his pen To varnish o'er the guilt of faithless men? His other works might have deserved applause, but now the language can't support the cause, while the clean current, 
though serene and bright, betrays a bottom odious to the sight. But now my muse, a softer strain rehearse, turn every line with art and smooth thy verse. The courtly waller next commands thy lays, muse tune thy verse with art to waller's praise, while tender airs and lovely dames inspire soft melting thoughts and propagate desire. So long shall Waller's strains our passion move, and Saccharissa's beauties kindle love. Thy verse, harmonious bard, and flattering song, can make the vanquished great, the coward strong. Thy verse can show even Cromwell's innocence, and compliment the storms that bore him hence. Oh, had thy muse not come an age too soon, but had seen great Nassau on the British throne, how had his triumphs glittered in thy page, and warmed thee to a more exalted rage! What scenes of death and horror had we viewed, and how had Boyne's wide current reeked in blood! Or if Maria's charms thou wouldst rehearse, in smoother numbers and a softer verse, thy pen had well described her graceful air, and Gloriana would have seemed more fair nor must Roscommon pass neglected by, that makes even rules a noble poetry, rules whose deep sense and heavenly numbers show the best of critics and of poets too, nor Denham must we e'er forget thy strains, while Cooper's Hill commands the neighbouring plains. But see where artful Dryden next appears, grown old in rhyme, but charming even in years, great Dryden next, whose tuneful muse affords the sweetest numbers and the fittest words. Whether in comic sounds or tragic airs she forms her voice, she moves our smiles or tears. If satire or heroic strains she writes, her hero pleases and her satire bites. From her no harsh, unartful numbers fall, she wears all dresses and she charms in all. How might we fear our English poetry, that long has flourished, should decay with thee? Did not the muse's other hope appear, harmonious Congreve, and forbid our fear? Congreve, whose fancy's unexhausted store has given already much, and promised more. Congreve shall still preserve thy fame alive, and Dryden's muse shall in his friend survive. I'm tired with rhyming, and would fain give o'er, but justice still demands one labour more. The noble Montague remains unnamed, for wit, for humour, and for judgment famed. To Dorset he directs his artful muse, in numbers such as Dorset's self might use. And negligently graceful he unreigns his verse, and writes in loose familiar strains. How Nassau's godlike acts adorn his lines, and all the hero in full glory shines. We see his army set in just array, and Boyne's dyed waves run purple to the sea, nor Simwa choked with men and arms and blood, nor rapid Xanthus celebrated flood, shall longer be the poet's highest themes, though gods and heroes fought promiscuous in their streams. But now, to Nassau's secret counsels raised, he aids the hero whom before he praised. I've done at length, and now, dear friend, receive the last poor present that my muse can give. I leave the arts of poetry and verse to them that practice them with more success. Of greater truths I'll now prepare to tell, and so at once, dear friend and muse, farewell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.